there was virtually no one who, having got the vaccine, went on to develop a serious form of COVID morbidity and mortality. That 95% efficacy number is just staggering. So the rescue is underway. We have vaccines for the coronavirus. They've been approved. They're being manufactured. They're being shipped. They're being administered first to those deemed most in need of them. And and what's that we hear surrounding this breakthrough news? Arguments. Hi, everybody. I'm John Donvan for Intelligence Squared, the debate series I host and referee. And like the whole battle over wearing face masks and like the fights over the lockdowns and the social distancing... We now find ourselves sparring over the vaccines. Who should get them first? Who should control their use? Who is saying, no way, I'm never going to get that shot? Today, I am going to talk about this new vein of pandemic debate with Dr. Larry Brilliant, an esteemed scientist and epidemiologist who, in the 1970s, helped to vanquish the disease called smallpox from the planet Earth. And if you've never heard of smallpox, that's partly because they were so successful in vanquishing it from planet Earth. It's the only time a disease that infects humans has been truly conquered. And it was accomplished with a vaccine. So Larry Brilliant was there when smallpox stopped being there. He knows vaccines. He knows how they work. He knows the good they do. He knows the politics that surround them. And he's going to help us think through the different sides of these arguments we're hearing now about the coronavirus vaccine. Make that vaccines, plural. Larry Brilliant, thanks so much for joining us on Intelligence Squared. John, thank you for having me. It's really a privilege to be with you. Larry, I, I want to play a little bit of uh, of a clip of an interview from uh, several weeks back uh, where Scott Gottlieb, who was formerly uh, the head of the uh, Food and Drug Administration, was talking uh, in a conversation with, uh, with Margaret Brennan of Face the Nation about how we set the priorities for who would get the vaccine first. And here's what he said. When Dr. Burke says vaccinate for impact, what does that mean? Well, it depends on what impact you're trying to achieve. If, you're, if your goal is to maximize the preservation of human life with a vaccine, then you would, you would bias the vaccine towards older Americans. You would try to get everyone over the age of 75 vaccinated first. There's about 20 million of, of those in that group. Okay. If your goal is to reduce the rate of infection, you would prioritize essential workers. So it depends on what impact you're trying to achieve. So, Larry Brilliant, I, I found it interesting to hear Scott Gottlieb telling us there that in this time of scarcity of the vaccine, and it's the scarcity really that is driving most of these arguments right now, that we have to make a kind of philosophical and functional choice about what our goals are, whether we want to save the lives of the most vulnerable right now or stop the transmission. And I don't think it's necessarily obvious to everyone that those two things can be incompatible. So so talk us through that, since since that is the, the basis of one of the first arguments going on right now is who should get it first. The choice he lays out between people who are really most vulnerable or people who are going to be involved in transmission, why are those two different groups? Well, I, I think if we take a step back, um, vaccines have been used historically for several different purposes. Uh, Clearly, stop people from getting infected. Stop people from whether or not they get infected to whether they get a severe case and wind up in the hospital. Stop people from spreading the disease, irrespective of whether they get sick or seriously sick. And then the fourth, which was true in Ebola two years ago in the Congo and helped us eradicate smallpox, a vaccine which is used for outbreak control in so-called ring vaccination. So right now, what is driving the decision for the the way in which Pfizer and Moderna optimized their choice of the, the way to study the vaccine, whether or not that's the way the vaccine or the only way the vaccine works, the way to study the vaccine is to, does the vaccine prevent major morbidity or mortality. And that's in part because our healthcare system is so fragile that when we are, uh, as today, having over 100,000 COVID patients in hospitals occupying ICUs, then other diseases, heart attacks, um, automobile accidents, emergency pregnancies, cancer treatment, can't get into the hospital. So you not only can prevent 
death from COVID, but you can also prevent the knock-on effects of a broken hospital care system. And, and these two new uh, mRNA vaccines have been colossally successful at doing that. 95% efficacy as measured by the fact that in both vaccine trials, there was virtually no one who, having got the vaccine, went on to develop a serious form of COVID morbidity and mortality. That 95% efficacy number is just staggering. So are we talking about a philosophical and, and moral choice, or are we talking about a practical choice in in deciding, for example, whether healthcare workers should be vaccinated before, say, the population of people over 65? Yeah, great questions, of course. Um, these are quandaries. And uh, ethicists, I, I majored in ethics as an undergraduate, <laughs> um, uh, but that doesn't arm me to answer this question. <laughs> um, ethicists will will um, will wrangle over these issues. You know, the the idea of vaccinating those people who are in hospitals, doctors, nurses, custodians, dietitians, and respiratory therapists, vaccinating them does come out of an equity uh, lens that these are the people who are risking their life for us. But it also comes out of a practical lens. If they get sick and die, and we've had hundreds of uh, these heroes die from COVID. Um, if we lose that, um, it doesn't matter how many hospitals you have, you can replace the, the bricks and mortar. You can't replace the people. So there's that. Um, the idea of vaccinating people living in nursing homes who are over the age of X, um, you know, the reality is that 80% of people who died in Georgia early on uh, were living in a nursing home. 75% of the people who died in Pennsylvania early on were living in a nursing home. Overall, for the entire pandemic, we're well over a third or close to a half of all the deaths are in that kind of a congregate facility. So it makes sense, not just um, morally, which uh, I think is one part of it, but also we want to stop death. Um, we, we can deal with people who are sick and have to be treated better than we can those who we've lost. The other aspects, does the vaccine uh, prevent uh, spread and can the vaccine be used after somebody has been exposed and used to stop an outbreak? Well, those are really interesting questions that I am interested in, but we may be early in trying to deal with those. There'll be additional studies. We should set, in, in my opinion, we should celebrate the fact that in almost exactly a year since this virus jumped from a bat to a human, we not only have two good vaccines and 144 other vaccines in line, but we've gone in less than a year from a novel virus to a global vaccination program on a scale never attempted before. Yeah, exactly. We, 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 it's, it's amazing. And you would think that celebration would be entirely the tone of the moment. And yet there is a lot of tension around this conversation. What do you think that's about? This is a really terrible disease. This is an awful disease. Everybody who's paying attention is frightened. And of course, we all have in mind someone that we love and who's near and dear who we want to see get vaccinated at, at some level. It's a terrible disease. And we, you, you don't stop to say, my God, it took smallpox 200 years after we had a vaccine before we had a global vaccination program. It took polio 70 years after we had a vaccine until we had a global polio eradication program with vaccines. That's not the thing you think about when you're confronted with the, the binary possibility, will I get vaccinated? Will my mother get vaccinated? I think this is totally expected. And uh, we should just be kind uh, and, um, and understand that this is a quandary. And uh, we, we need to get Intelligence Square to have debates on it. Yeah, well, we're looking forward to that. Um, I, I mentioned at the outset that scarcity is uh, probably the thing that's driving all of this. Um, we're talking about just in this country alone of a population of 330 uh, million people and a delivery of first uh, first course vaccines. And people, of course, uh, many of these vaccines are going to need a follow-up of 40 million doses. So uh, choices have to be made. Is scarcity 
always going to be inevitable in the case of a vaccination program, or is this an unusual situation because of the speed and the emergency that it represents? It it may not actually be absolute scarcity. It's more time based scarcity. I think mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. we we certainly have a pipeline that over a number of years would deliver the billions of vaccines that we will need. We have cost issues. We have equity issues. Uh, we have international versus domestic issues. We actually have the issue that I hate to raise, which is one dose or two um, issues. And um, you why know, do you hate right to raise now, that? Well, I, I I think that the manufacturers, Pfizer and Moderna, certainly um, have said that in order to achieve what they've promised, this 95% efficacy, you have to fulfill the full two-dose um, regimen. And for all we know, there may be another annual booster or some other kind of accelerant later on. But if you look at the data, it looks like one dose gives you some kind of immunity. Mm-hmm. So I, I don't have an opinion. I am cognizant that the debate between do you vaccinate 10 people with one dose or five people with two doses, it's a legitimate discussion, even though I know the manufacturers would like us not to have that discussion. Um, again, I'm not sure how I feel about this. It would depend on uh, what did the pipeline look like for the next batches of vaccine. One of our uh, past debaters on Intelligence Squared is Ezekiel Emanuel, who is at the University of Pennsylvania. He's an oncologist. He's also somebody who spends a lot of time thinking about medical ethics. And some months back now, he was beginning to wrestle with the question of who gets to go first. And uh, he appeared on a podcast uh, sponsored by uh, JAMA. And uh, I want to share a, a little bit about of, of what he said uh, about about setting priorities, because he said something I found uh, quite interesting that I, I want to ask you to bite into. So here's Zeke Emanuel. So the primary goal is, I think, to reduce uh, premature mortality of people. Um, now, a lot of people assume, oh, well, that means healthcare workers get it first, and then the uh, people who are uh, uh, at highest risk get it first. That may not be true. That may not be the best way to reduce premature mortality. It may be better uh, to, for example, uh, immunize people who are at high risk of transmitting the virus, both because of jobs, living situations, and other circumstances. You know, so I don't know that health, frontline healthcare workers are necessarily <laughs> the first uh, ought to be necessarily at the highest priority, given that they can don it up uh, PPE uh, effectively. So what what I found interesting there was, and again, I want to point out, he was talking back in August before the uh, CDC came up with its recommendations. In fact, the CDC earlier this month, early in December, did uh, set guidelines that healthcare workers, uh, as well as uh, residents of long-term healthcare facilities, would be first. They were in Group 1A to receive the vaccines that were delivered this week. So, you know, we're taking him a little bit out of time in that regard. And also, I want to point out that I compressed that quote a little bit. There's a some small edit in the middle, but it did not affect uh, the thrust of what he was saying. But he was making the, the case that, well, frontline healthcare workers don't need to go first because they have another option, which is PPE, which on the face of it does seem to be, you know, mechanically true. And uh, again, he was not taking strong sides on that. He was musing at that point. But that sort of musing over the choices that were in front of us at that point. D- tell us what about this whole process? Well, Ezekiel is a smart guy and his musings are important. Um, you know, do you, if you can identify the super spreaders who create the clusters, how do you prioritize vaccinating them and stopping that acceleration of the pandemic versus almost anything else? But, you know, I, I sort of uh, default back to the, the committee that was established by the National Academy of Sciences called the Equitable Use of Vaccine Committee. And it was chaired by Helene Gale, who used to be the head of care and an EIS officer, CDC-trained physician epidemiologist, and Bill Fage, uh, who was the head of CDC and uh, you know won the Presidential Medal of Freedom and is, is a hero to all of us in epidemiology and a terrific cast on their committee. And they, they really analyze all of these issues. Um, and their report, 
which I have read and is available on the National Academy site, um, it does cover almost everything we've raised. And they've got enough people from a, a, a heterogeneous background. And I think that the cadence that they've recommended is one that is a reasonable one to follow. You can debate every single word in, uh, in that report, but it's, it's really a very profound report. It did inform the CDC committee report as well, the ACIP committee. Um, look, if we have a speed of delivery where today we get 20 million and by Thursday we have a billion doses, many of these arguments will be moot. Mm -hmm. If we don't get a speed of delivery, and I'm including not just Moderna and Pfizer, AstraZeneca and J&J &J and all the other ones that are coming down the pike, then these conversations, which are theoretical, will become life and death, and they will become hard, harder uh, to have. So for right now, um, I, I support what uh, Bill and uh, Helene's committee has recommended, which is what we're doing right now. Um, if, if we have a bigger delay in vaccine delivery, um, I think we revisit a lot of this stuff. So it's... Um it could be the theoretical and it could well be the reality that we're going to be facing depending on the speed of delivery is what you're saying. I am. I, 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 I would also put an asterisk on something because, you know, there's been this debate on whether you can ever achieve herd immunity by letting people become infected naturally. That's the Scott Atlas, uh, <laughs> um, the uh, Swedish model kind of idea, which I think has been debunked. But But there's... It's been replaced by this idea that we go to herd immunity by vaccination, which is historically the way epidemiologists have talked about herd immunity. And the reason we have this formula on how great a percentage of the population needs to be vaccinated to get herd immunity is based on real life experience. It, it, it works in, in closed uh, quarters, but it didn't work in smallpox. We were not able to achieve herd immunity or rather we uh, vaccinated more people than would have been calculated to be herd immunity, and yet the virus continued to kill children. And it wasn't until the same Bill Fage, uh, when he was a young doctor in Nigeria, a medical missionary, came up with a different way of allocating vaccine. Instead of allocating it either to healthcare workers or the elderly or the most vulnerable, he decided the most moral way to allocate it was to those people who were most susceptible in the moment, the highest risk people at that day. And they were the neighbors, the family members, the people who lived very close in a ring around uh, a case of smallpox, because the only place you can get smallpox is from somebody who has it. The only way you can get COVID is from somebody who has it, more or less. So both of those have comparability. And mm -hmm. Bill in doing that, published a paper, changed the world, moved it away from mass vaccination towards selective epidemiological control, use of vaccines in outbreak containment. He was, and, and that's what led to the eradication of smallpox. He was fortunate in that the vaccine used to eradicate smallpox had a characteristic that I'm going to call PEP. It's post-exposure prophylaxis. I'm sorry about that. But it literally means that if you're vaccinated after you've been exposed and you're infected, maybe not yet infectious, but you're infected, you could be vaccinated and abort the disease from ever reaching fulfillment. Or Wow. And that, that characteristic was also true to a lesser extent, but in a real way in the Ebola vaccine that was created only two years ago to be mm -hmm. used in the Congo to stop the Ebola outbreak. So it seems to me if we can either get lucky or plan for a vaccine that has a characteristic like that, rapid onset, developing immunity really quick, even in the face of someone already exposed, you would then change everything. We'd start using testing, tracing, and isolation, but it would be testing, tracing, and immunization, <laughs> or testing, tracing, isolation, and immunization. That would be a vaccine sparing program. It would take a fraction of the amount of vaccine. So I hope that for the vaccine manufacturers who listen to this and the scientists who support them, that we are really looking carefully 
to see if any of the vaccines currently in the portfolio on the waiting list um, have that characteristic. And we should think about the moral issue of prioritizing vaccines that would have that vaccine sparing effect and that ability more quickly to bring COVID to, to zero. When smallpox was taken on in the 60s and 70s, was there a divisiveness about it? Were there arguments in the way that we're seeing now? Um, no, I think 99% of people were, were positive smallpox could not be eradicated. <laughs> not much of an argument. Um, uh, smallpox was the fourth disease to be considered to be eradicated by the World Health Assembly, uh, which is the organ of which WHO makes decisions. All the health ministers come together in May in Geneva when when there's not a pandemic and you can't travel. Uh, and uh, we had tried uh, eradicating malaria. We had tried um, eradicating yaws, and we tried eradicating yellow fever. And we had failed as a world to do that, uh, malaria because we could no longer use DDT, yellow fever because monkeys got yellow fever and they were not willing to hold their hand out to be vaccinated, I think, in a nice line. Uh, and yaws for a non-venereal spirochete for a different reason. So smallpox was the fourth disease to be eradicated. In many ways, it was the most preposterous because it was ubiquitous. Uh, in the 20th century, the first 75 years of the 1900s, smallpox uh, claimed between 300 million and half a billion victims. It's like nothing we've ever seen before or since. And it was a 10,000-year-old disease that always always been around. But a Russian professor and uh, minister of health and, and uh, ambassador to WHO uh, named uh, Vladimir Zhdanov, an unsung hero of the story, proposed at the WHO meeting that the U.S. and the Soviet Union, then having 20,000 nuclear missiles pointed at each other, um, that the Soviet Union and the U.S. collaborate on a global program to eradicate smallpox. And there was a lot of negotiation, a lot of skepticism. Um, and initially... The U.S. didn't want to do it, but ultimately when uh, D.A. Henderson, uh, an American who was then running the EIS service at CDC, was selected to run it, um, I, I would say the Soviet Union and the United States really collaborated very well. And the magic of that program is that uh, uh, doctors and epidemiologists from 30, 40, 50 countries, Jews, Christians, Buddhists, Muslims, Hindus, all kinds of Christian denominations, every color of the rainbow, all work together. Hmm. And uh, that moment in time is what led to the eradication of smallpox with WHO in that leadership position. Uh, I'm not so sure that we have the same favorable um, tailwind today, but yeah. uh, it'll take something like that to really uh, uh, eradicate, if we can, asterisk because of animal reservoir covid I, I want to return to today and some of some more of the us them uh, conversation that's taking place around this. So, President Biden has uh, made uh, dealing with the coronavirus in a different way, and he says a more serious and comprehensive way, a priority of his uh, of his term beginning in January. And um, I, partly he's talking about testing, but he's also talking uh, contact tracing as well. But he's also talking about vaccination. And here's something he said on that. 100 million shots in the first 100 days. And we'll follow the guidance of science to get the vaccines to those most at risk. That includes healthcare professionals, people in long-term care, and as soon as possible, we'll include educators. I bring that up because his call for educators, essentially he's talking about let's get this vaccine to teachers, was challenged uh, actually the week that we're recording this in the Washington Post by uh, a writer and thinker named Ray DeMonico, who's with the Manhattan Institute, which is a, a conservative-leaning uh, think tank based out of New York. And he was he was questioning the idea of prioritizing teachers. He, I'll write, read a little bit of what he published in the Washington Post. He says, doing so doesn't make sense if the goal is to get back to normal as quickly as possible by protecting essential workers. In our urban centers, he asks, should teachers get the jump on bus and taxi drivers and transit workers 
who are confined in extremely close quarters with the general population, but are nonetheless vital to keeping our cities functioning. And what about immigrant farm laborers, he asks. Many of these people, he says, have had to pay for child care that they cannot afford or miss work without wages to supervise school-aged children engaged in the remote learning that teachers' unions have demanded. So so Ray DeMonico is, is, a, is a longtime and uh, frequent and constant critic of teachers' unions. And I think to some degree that animates his argument. And I don't quite get his argument that uh, teachers getting back to the classroom it would, would be due to being vaccinated. It sounds like it would be a good thing and would let all of these parents go back to work because their kids would be in school. So I don't quite follow that part of his argument. But his basic his basic point being uh, that the teachers should not be at the front of the line. I just want to talk that through with you because. There are implications to teachers being able to go back to school and teachers continuing to only teach from home that have a larger impact than just on the health of the teachers. There's a question of the health of the students. There's a question about the mental health of the families. There's a question about uh, the quality of the education that these kids are able to receive. We know that it's not going so well with the online learning, that failure rates are high. Um, in a sense, there might be a little bit of a lost generation of six and seven and eight and up to 15-year-olds at this point. Who knows? I, I want to ask you, how much does that figure into an epidemiologist's calculation about who should go first in line? That sort of knock-on effect, those second-order consequences of who gets vaccinated and who doesn't? Uh, there's a lot in that question. So w- when we look at any of the various sectors— whether it's the healthcare sector, the educational sector, industrial sector, small business sector, um, you, 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 you name it, the people in nursing homes, we can find many justifications for prioritizing the scarce resource that vaccines are. And going back to your earlier question, are these forced dichotomous trade-offs, false choices in many ways, hmm. are they driven by the combination of current scarcity and perceived scarcity in the future and the cadence with which we will get deliveries of vaccine. And I think they are. Of course, it makes sense. If you want to get kids back to school the fastest, then you have to make sure that the adults in the school are not transmitting the disease because the kids transmit less than the adults. You, You also have to make sure that everybody gets tests, tested with the new round of testing that we'll be getting in the next two, three months, the the $5, five-minute at-home test, which will clear up a lot of the issues about making spaces safe, whether it's a school, the Republican or Democratic convention, a Hollywood production, a theater. A lot of technology is coming on board. The virus is known to uh, travel at, you know, a a rapid uh, speed uh, that we've we talked to as, as if it were exponential speed. Science uh, in this 2020 bad, difficult year is also traveling at exponential speed. And all that's coming on board. But rather than look in that direction, if you would let me, John, I would like to raise a couple of names. Mm-hmm. Vietnam, Singapore, Taiwan, Iceland, New Zealand. I could go on. South Korea. These are countries that for a period of time, in the case of Vietnam, 200 days, Singapore and Taiwan, over 100 days, they eliminated COVID from their country. They went down to zero, no vaccine, all done by various permutations of careful testing, tracing, and isolation. Contact tracing in Vietnam was as much as 100%. In the United States, by comparison, it's 5%. In the case of Taiwan, they didn't do anything different. They were just fast as hell. They just Mm -hmm. got there really quick. So there's a a lot of different ways to lower the ambient viral load so that you can then see the clusters and see the outbreaks and then respond. We need to understand that vaccines, wonderful, legendary, amazing, are, if I can use the Swiss cheese model, they are one slice of Swiss cheese (laughs) in a package of Swiss cheese. As testing is one slice, as wearing face masks, one slice, social distancing, one slice, isolation, and 
all the other things that we know we need to do and the way we need to get to zero COVID, and we should be focused on that, the way we get to zero COVID is by having each one of those slices of Swiss cheese with their imperfections layered over the other so you have a pack. This was an idea from an industrial designer many years ago, but it's been resurrected to think about the way to construct a program to get us to zero. We need all of those things. And if we have all of those elements and we're paying attention to them, and now you add on vaccines, then we will we could be at zero before we have enough vaccine to reach herd immunity, certainly. So I'm just saying, I, I don't wanna minimize the uh, ethical issues that he raises about vaccinating teachers ahead of bus drivers. Uh, that, that, that's just, I, I don't think that we have the data and the information to be able to ask that question. I'm not so sure we got the morality to answer that question. Well, do, do we have the morality to take on a, a, another issue that, that is definitely coming up? And, and by the way, I'm, I'm hearing what you're saying. Uh, there's a lot of slices in the package of Swiss cheese. Uh, but but on, the, on the dividing lines on this particular part of the conversation, one of them focuses on uh, whether, given that COVID-19 is disproportionately impacting and killing um, African Americans uh, and and Latino people in the Latino community as well. Um, we're hearing uh, the the argument being made like by places like uh, uh, JAMA. There's a viewpoint article that's quoted by the Harvard School of Public Health. I, I'll, I'll read the actual language that Harvard put out. Racial minorities have been disproportionately affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. Prioritizing access to a vaccine for these minorities can be justified on epidemiological, economic, and social justice grounds. And I, I want to ask you, how do we have that conversation? Particularly if, if, the, if the case can be made epidemiologically and economically, the social justice part of it, how do we have a conversation about that that would be constructive and not divisive? Well, there's no question that... Uh that the prioritization of the African-American community uh, can be justified epidemiologically, also historically. The Tecumseh experiments where our government experimented uh, on African-Americans, deliberately infecting them with syphilis in some instances to see how it worked. Um, there's a fear in the African-American community, legitimate in most instances, about um, can they trust what they're being told? Um, we have to take cognizance of that. Um, and if you just look at the numbers in, in Georgia, 80% of the early deaths were African-American, double the percent representation in the population. We would be um, not scientific. We'd be cruel if we didn't take these things into account. But they are of a piece. Uh, I, I don't want to be simplistic, but the major reason we're in the problem that we face right now, and I'm going to go back to that Dickinsonian idea of a tale of two cities, uh, it's a tale of two countries. When those countries I just mentioned, Vietnam and South Korea and Taiwan and uh, New Zealand and Iceland, when they look at us, they say, what the hell happened to my friends at the United States of America? How could you have screwed this up so badly? They're looking at that. And the single most important reason that we screwed it up so badly, where they didn't, is we don't have a national plan. We devolved to the states, and I would say to these other interest groups, decisions over our plan of attack to cities, to mayors, to regional interests. Um, you know, it, it has never been like this before in the United States. We would have CDC, FDA. Um, we would have a, a group of scientists brought together at the National Academy or wherever it was. We'd make a national plan. It would go to uh, the White House. They would approve that plan. And then there'd be meetings with all the state epidemiologists, the health directors, the governors. And we would all work in lockstep together to rid ourselves of Zika or HIV AIDS, mm -hmm. tuberculosis. Mm -hmm. That's what's been missing, this absence of a concerted national strategy and plan. So all these issues that we're talking about are each important in their own. They each are valid uh, issues for your debating, for moral quandaries, but they will look different if they are part of a national strategy than they look if uh, looked at in isolation. 
So if Intelligence Squared were to do a debate where the resolution was priority on vaccines during a period of scarcity should be given to communities of color, you you would feel that that is a legitimate debate question, that one, one that we should take on and that we could go deep on both sides? Or do you think it's a slam dunk on one side or the other? I think it's a legitimate debate as long as you allow one of the sides to say, in the context of a national plan mm -hmm. that has this amount of resources and funding and that has this goal, and, and I, I would say the goal should be zero COVID. Uh, I'd love to use the word eradicate, but as I mentioned before, when mink and cats and uh, non-human primates are able to get the disease and spread it, you've got to put an asterisk on the use of the word eradicate. But I want this awful virus gone. I want it gone for everybody. I want it gone for every country. It has to be gone in every country or it'll come back to every other country, ours too. Um, I want a national plan and I want an international plan. And until we've done that, that's the place to adjudicate these issues, to debate these issues. If you just take out one, then you're going to wind up with angels dancing over whether it's a 16-year-old or an 18-year-old. That the upper level of uh, well, the, the the dancing is sort of happening already, and and as you've pointed out, um, the CDC issues national guidelines, but the guidelines are not mandatory. They can be uh, they they are there to guide states and localities uh, in making decisions, and 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 then the states are kind of in the firing line on the decision making. There, uh, it it just happened uh, earlier this month. There was a discussion that the CDC guidelines were going to include vaccinations for incarcerated P uh, Americans, people in prisons. Um, and in the there was some discussion that that population was more vulnerable because of being so densely clustered than the population of healthy people over the age of 65. You're over 65, you're more vulnerable, but if you're not sick at the moment or have any sort of comorbidity, the argument was you don't need it that fa as fast as the people in prison. And the, the governor of, of Colorado, when he was seen by some critics to be accepting that framework, was so, was so criticized for it that he, he pushed back and he said, no, no, we're not going to do that. I'm going to just quote him. He said, that's not going to, that won't happen. There's no way that prisoners are going to get it before members of a vulnerable population. There's no way it's going to go to prisoners before it goes to people who haven't committed any crime. That's obvious. And I find, I find the mixture of the departure from science into politics in that one sort of quite disheartening, but also kind of a perfect example of of the problem that I think we've been talking about in this podcast about the ability of uh, the, the ability for all of us to kind of lose our heads over this. I, I think, John, you're answering your own question. Um, the CDC that I know and love and trained at and everybody who's an epidemiologist has visited like Mecca with, with respect uh, has been depressed, distressed, distanced, ignored, and politically manipulated. The recommendations that have come from the CDC over the past year have bit, looked more like a weather vane than they've looked like uh, scientists uh, with an informed decision. And CDC still has the best scientists in the world. It needs to be, uh, <laughs> I, I want to have a campaign, free CDC, liberate CDC. Um, th once you get that kind of science-based advice because the goal is zero. The goal is zero. We should be organizing our vaccination program towards zero. We should be organizing our testing towards zero. We should be organizing our use of monoclonal antibodies towards zero. Everything should be coordinated as it has always been. It's the reason why CDC has always been the crown jewel in the necklace of American institutions seen from the rest of the world. If we can get back to that, I'm sure that the Biden administration, especially Ron Klain, will be able to get CDC back to that position. It still has the same great people. Um, once we do that, we'll, we'll all be, you know, I hate to be, you know, Pollyanna, but we'll be roaring, ro rowing together in the same direction instead of fighting over um, what are important, critical, but parts of the puzzle. Um, I don't know 
if you knew that I, I, I wrote a book on the history of autism and two to three chapters deal with the period in the early 2000s when the wrong idea took hold among a large part of the population that vaccines caused autism. And what I found interesting about that phenomenon is that the people who were rejecting the use of vaccines, or at least raising flags about their use, because they were not of one piece. Some people were just asking for uh, reassurances and for further study, but some people were just flat out, I'm never going to use a vaccine, so I don't want to lump them all together. But what I found interesting is that vaccine resistance came from both the right and the left. So on the right, you had people saying, I don't want the government telling me what, what to stick things in my body. On the right, you had people saying, my body is my God-given temple and uh, we should not be messing with it with uh, chemicals being put in by the science, scientific establishment. And on the left, you had people saying, I don't trust corporations who make these things. And on the left, you had people who were saying, uh, you know, they're not organic. And, uh, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm living a sort of holistic lifestyle and, and foreign chemicals don't have a part in that. And I found that really, really interesting that that the... The fragility of the trust in vaccines is, let me put it another way, the trust in vaccines is very fragile. It's very brittle. It can snap very easily and with devastating consequences. I'm wondering why that is. What is it about this particular medical procedure or treatment, I'm not sure of the correct word, that makes it so vulnerable to suspicion and mistrust and fear. And in the days to come, what message would you share with the general population about dealing with those concerns? So I was uh, privileged to see the last case of variola major in nature, that little girl named Rahima Banu on the island of, of Bola in Bangladesh. And when uh, her scabs fell off and they were cooked by the hot sun, uh, the virus had no place to go. There were no vir viral particles left. Thus ended a chain of transmission unbroken for more than 10,000 years. Back to Pharaoh Ramses V, billions of people killed by this disease. The disease stopped by vaccine, by a vaccination program. I was also in India when the last cases of polio in India occurred. Again, we're close to eradicating the second human disease only because of a vaccine. But the first Smallpox vaccine, which was in 1797, uh, was followed in 1798 by an anti-vax movement. Um, and it, it is, it's partially because it was so improbable that you could take pus from the finger of a milkmaid who had been milking a cow and, and caught a disease that was on the udder of the cow. You could take that pus and inject it into a little child, and that child would be free from yet a third disease, smallpox. That shouldn't that should that should have been a science fiction story, but it was true. And so the I think that some of the impossibility and probability of vaccines make it uh, such an object of uh, fear, concern, divisiveness. Um, during the polio eradication program, uh, the program itself was almost stopped by Islamic resistance to the vaccine because of rumors that the vaccine had been implanted with something that would make Muslim men. Uh, sterile. Uh, Bill Gates flew to Kano, Nigeria, personally, I think in a heroic way, and met with the mullahs there uh, to explain to them his philanthropy, what he was doing, and and they reversed their order, their fatwa against the vaccine. I've seen vaccine resistance at a level and scale far greater than we are seeing now hmm. against COVID, and I don't expect that the vaccine resistance will end uh, because. A lot of why people are resistant to the vaccine makes sense. Look, if if you're thinking that uh, everybody needs to get vaccinated to get herd immunity and you've got 99% of herd immunity, then the question you're asked is, should I take an incremental risk when somebody else might do that for me and then I'll be a free rider and be safe? Should I risk my child even though I have no real fear or Said another way, should a kid who's immunocompromised not be able to go to school because I'm going to force my kids to be able to go to that same school without vaccine? These are gut-wrenching, critical decisions, and we haven't even talked about autism. 
which is perhaps the most difficult, heart-rendering issue of all. And the deceit of Andrew Wakefield, a real physician who fabricated a study that slipped through the usually good editors of Lancet and was published with that imprimatur of Lancet. And even though he was um, caused to lose his medical license because of of that fraud, um, and Lancet issued retraction after retraction, once that enters into the public bloodstream, the social media bloodstream, it's been really difficult to, uh, to, to bring that back. These are really difficult, hard issues. But if you put yourself in my position, I saw the last case of smallpox uh, in nature. And I just want to check, you literally saw the last case? You're not being figurative about that. No, you no, met I, the individual. I, I literally, I mean, asterisk, again, there were a lot of last cases. There were lab accidents. There was variola minor, a different right. strain. I saw the last case of variola major in nature um, mm-hmm. in Bangladesh, in Bola Island in, seven, in 1975 with Isao Arita, a Japanese epidemiologist, who was my boss, who flew me uh, to the island because this young girl was, we hoped, would be, by the way, we had hoped 10 other people would have been the last case and they weren't, but hmm. she really was the last case. And um, epidemiologists after epidemiologists have gone to visit her. Her house for a while was a shrine. We took up collections for her family. You know, this is a, in my world, it was vaccinations and a, and a clever way of using vaccines in a ring vaccination way that allowed us to have a last case. Um, there will be a last case of polio. Uh, hopefully one day there'll be a last case of malaria. These are things that will only be possible through vaccines. So when, when, if you put yourself in my position, um, I look at the enormous amount of good that has been done by routine childhood vaccination. Uh, the, the fact that uh, 50 years ago, 80% of kids were stunted or wasted because of the diseases they got from childhood disease. They're almost all gone now because of vaccines. So I see the enormous amount of good, but I am not blind or insensitive or, or uh, dismissive of the real agony of a parent who has a child that is autistic or a parent who has a child that is fragile themselves and they don't want to risk them against vaccines or that, or that the people around them are really smug scientists and won't allow them to talk about it. So that's, that's, that's uh, to go to the question I've been talking about all along is how do we talk about that? So what you are suggesting is that, that the individuals who have these concerns need to be heard out and they need to be de- 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 listened to with respect and with seriousness and not put down and not called stupid, which is often the case, or ignorant of science, which is often the case, which doesn't seem to be very persuasive in any case. Well, also, you know, like everything else in life, there's diminishing marginal returns. Uh, when you have 25, 26 vaccines, vaccinations given to a child in the first year or two of their life, they are not all of equal value. And there's been an insensitivity uh, from the medical community to look at all those vaccines and say, well, wait a minute. Uh, we can reduce the animus towards vaccinations if we alter that program. Right. Uh, we focus on the most important things, what scientists are supposed to do. Um, so, no, I think there's a lot that has to happen um, in order to um, make people understand, feel comfortable with, make the right choices. Um, in India, there was something called the 1895 Bengal Immunity Act, which allowed us uh, in the smallpox program, to forcibly vaccinate people who were exposed to the disease and were carrying it and wanted to leave their city and might carry it as some did to other countries. Um, probably the most gut-wrenching decision I ever faced was do you use the awesome power that's given to you by that law to ever forcibly vaccinate someone against their will? And how do you make that choice when someone without the vaccination would be carrying the disease into a city of millions of vulnerable people. Um, There's a lot of other uh, gut-wrenching, difficult moral decisions that vaccines and its uh, both its great strength and its great uh, fear-producing quality that need to be discussed thoroughly. The last note I want to touch on before we wrap is 
in this interim period between now and projections seem to look forward towards the middle to the end of the summer when there would be sufficient vaccine production online for everybody who wants vaccine to have it, have it at least the first dose. During that interim period, are we going to have a sort of unofficial caste system of people who have been vaccinated and those who have not? Would they be identified? Would they be traced? Would people who have been vaccinated be allowed into certain places that the unvaccinated are not allowed into? Is that a good thing? Is- you're, you're opening up the Coachella bracelet of vaccine and immunity certificate issue. Uh, this is certainly something widely debated, argued about, uh, talked about. I, I, again, I think it depends on the speed and quantity of vaccines and the availability and to what extent it is the elite who, who get there first. If we have sufficient quantity in a, in a short enough time period, then the value of having uh, these enclaves will, will dissipate. But that, that is absolutely something to think about, as are all of your questions. So thank you very much for having me. Uh, thank you for challenging uh, all of my assumptions and everything I've seen um, and make me think about all these things anew. It's, it's really an honor to be with you today. Larry, thank you for your time and for tactfully concluding this interview and the time you had available. I thank you for that. Uh, I just want to say that uh, your, your inspiration, uh, your idealism, your realism as well, uh, are really an inspiration. Uh, thank you so much for joining us at Intelligence Squared. This is John Donvan, and I just want to take a moment to remind you about Intelligence Squared. We are a nonprofit. We're a a philanthropy, and our mission is to restore critical thinking and fact and reason to American public discourse. And we do that by making all of our programming, including the conversation you just listened to, available to the public free of charge. If you want to support this show and our mission, please visit us online at iq2us.org. And thank you, our audience, for tuning into this episode of Intelligence Squared, which was recorded on Tuesday, December 15th, 2020. I hope you enjoyed it as much as we did. Intelligence Squared is a nonprofit generously funded by listeners like you and by the Rosencrantz Foundation. Clea Connor is our CEO. David Ariosto is head of editorial. Amy Kraft is chief of staff and leads production. Shay O'Mara is our consulting producer. Jen Zelmer is our senior researcher. Damon Whittemore is our radio producer. Robert Rosencrantz is our chairman, and I'm your host, John Donvan, and saying thank you so much for listening.